Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Reeves a lot, lover. But a mayor's request. Usually, the Reich's commissary had kept Shan drunk and Oblin, Oblin, far away from each other. Oblin, as mayor of Brest, worked only a few miles from Assan's borders. The UNA was never deployed so far west, its handlers feared defections to the Banderists or Democrats, probably correctly. Thus, the meetings between Shandrunk and Olublin were short and irregular. Unusual punctures and two disconnected mon monotonies. That's why Olublin's request for a meeting in Brest seemed unusual. <coughs> the discussion started out nicely. Shandrunk and Olublin walked through the isolated forest, talking about their lives, posts, and most importantly, their woes. There are a few times the Ukrainian in the ploy of Germans could complain. Shandrunk felt a sense of ease finally t talking to someone he knew as a friend. It was only after they were deep in the forest that other blends moved suddenly and shifted. Have you considered the possibility of working with outside parties? Sean's drunk paused, visibly uncomfortable. So that's why you wanted to meet outside. I certainly see myself retiring someday, if that helps. The general said wryly, uncertain if such a thing was even possible. If the world permits it, I'd love to return a life of memoirs instead of. Well, this, but... While I can, and think I do, implore Kiev to do better, I can't jeopardize whatever progress I've made here by venturing off on heroics. Olyblin turned towards the general, disappointed. You could save Ukraine, you know, or I could kill it. I'm in my 70s. I'm too old to be making rash decisions, and I'm 63. A better Ukraine isn't going to fall into relapse one way or another. We're going to have to create it, or I'm going to fight for it anyways. To never lose a generation. Laying our hopes down to some sort of collapse is the exact line of thought which lost us Filkov. And Perotrovich and countless other young men. The Reich is strong as ever, and their units are replenished regularly and can't even harass enemy supply lines anymore. Miksim Konejuk thought the meeting was going swimmingly, as in... It hadn't earned it already, which most of the rooms seemed to want. <coughs> Excuse me. We have nothing then. We can't feed our troops. Defections are rising. The people don't even speak Ukrainian. There's no national feeling at all, it seems, much less class consciousness. Reading is the only thing that excites the men. Probably because all your men are common murderers and bandits wearing old uniforms. That's enough, Kornyuchuk. Stood above the other commanders, who all Im immediately yielded. We all know our fillers. We stare them in the face daily. How many countless times do I wish Filikov had lived and that I had not ordered him to raid Kharkiv? These photos of Petrovich dangling from a tree still haunt me. We have all made mistakes, that is the only thing I know surely. Our failures hang over every village we plunder for a few chickens while the whole nation starved. It hangs over every city, ruin by ruins. Ring by ruins. <clears throat> it hangs over the graves of men we ordered to their deaths. It hangs over me, heavier and heavier with each passing moment. The whole room was silent now. Not a man averted their gaze from Kornichuk's steely visage, and not a man discre disagreed. <clears throat> What we have is what we have. I have talked to peasants who view themselves not as Ukrainians or even as Russians, but simply as residents of farms. I converse with factory workers who don't even remember Soviet times and who believe that every word of Hitlerite propaganda. <clears throat> I shall not lie. The situation is bleaker, bleaker than you know. However, we still fight and we will continue to fight for Ukraine whenever we'll never live unless we do. Gronia Chuck sunk into his chair. The room returned to a dim, slight dim. As each commander rattled off possible strategies, the meeting ended with each man leaving one by one, their cause bloody, but just as necessary. The end, deep in the forest. Between scattered and hidden fortifications, a small fire roared. Around it, Bodan and his fellow parsons quietly ate their fill. It was a disgusting meal, watery yet overwhelmed by the taste of a buckshot, but Bodan had come to accept such things long ago. His commander stood above them, less imposing than usual. He had a look in his eyes, a slight squint. If looking at Bodan's view, then faded away just as quickly. As the fire began to fade, the commander called to his men to attention. Comrades, I've received some unpleasant news. The hideout of our fellow division, a few miles north of here, was uncovered by the fascist government yesterday evening. We received no word since. It's lucky the worst has occurred. <clears throat> it wasn't the first time the commander had been forced to give such news. They heard the same story far too many times now. A simple fact was emerging, one that Bodan knew the danger of internalizing fully. They might be dead tomorrow. A silence fell over the soldiers, only broken by the spoons and occasional crackle of the fire. As the last gasp of the fire illuminated his comrades' faces, Bodan could see that each was, in their own quiet manner, grappling with the same fears, the same story, and casting it aside. He that rages. Late at that night, the boss of the Ukrainian nation, one Dmitro Kichikivsky by name, sat alone in the front of the desk, stolen by the office of a German official. Years of plans and reports lay in front of him, the past, present, and the future all reduced to handwriting the odd printed manuscript. <clears throat> Kichikivsky, mind wandered, that Azdaya, well, that was the OU, and had come far since those early days of being backstabbed by the Polish scum and then taking the golden opportunity provided by the German invasion to avenge themselves forevermore, as it was a right. But for 17 years or so now, the father of Kielczkiewski's movement, Stepan Bandera, had not been there to watch their progress, for the German dudes had taken them to a concentration camp, never to return. <clears throat> the Vaz wondered, what would Bandera feel about how the OUN know the UPA had done since his departure? Would they give him pride, hope for the future, or would there be merely a sense of disappointment, or yet worse, anger and rage? Dmitro Kielczkiewski would never think of admitting it to anybody, but such thoughts disturbed him beyond belief. Sometimes they even made him wrathful. There was much yet to do, nonetheless, much more blood yet still to spill.
It's not enough. Every Bannon killed, every Bolshevik rat's nest unturned, every UPA fanatic extinguished, every sentimentalist bureaucrat assigned to nowhere, all of it will be for nothing. Cock. Has seen the truth of what it is. Simply too much of the administration, staff of the week, Lebrun's weak world Rosenbergites, clinging to the old fool's dream from 20 years ago, Oldendorf's sneering SS men, Brautagam's treasonous suits, all of them fail to realize that the Slav, Ukrainian, Russian, or otherwise stands only, understands only violence. And yet they cannot be removed at this time. Cock has seen the writing on the wall, he must receive approval and support from the Reich itself to restore the true national socialist governance of Ukraine, or the colony will soon perish. Fortunately, much of the party uh, has not mentioned, has not, not to mention Hitler himself, shares such values, of views. All he must do is travel there. He that plots. <coughs> Sitting alone in a darkened room, lit only by the candle, he had found some place. Yaroslav Simonovich Stetsko upon it alone, whereas Stetsko knew Klyachivitsky. Klyachkivsky might take the opportunity conferred by such a setting to succumb to the truth of thoughts about what Bandura's corpse might thought of them. Stetsko had better things to worry about. Writing out strange diagrams and ideological screeds for which the UPA knew him best, Stetsko wondered about how to best test out the loyalty of his semi allies. Piasetsky and Mivsky would be prudent for him to take them aside someplace or to meet with them in his own home. Would be more opportune to rather secure others' loyalty, the loyalty of Piazetsky and Mivsky's confidants, than looking into winning them over. For that matter, Setsko wondered how, then how long would he deal with the rest of the UPA and if and when a breakout or conflict took place. Shaking his head vigorously, he focused on the specific things he was planning. The pen shook at Setsko's hands as he scribbled out the last plans. There was something big in the band's mind, and he was very clearly eager to see it brought to completion. As someone would appear into the room, only to, one thing was clear. The Yaroslav Stetsko was plotting something big in a visit for old time's sake. Destiny's work will soon come to an end. Erdogan was not always the Reich's principal authority in Ukraine. Before he passed by the savage land, he was a Gauleiter, an Oba president of Eastern Prussia, titles which he still holds to this day, indeed. Kok was quite visiting, fond of visiting his old stopping grounds in some years, even spending some time in his Gao, then the Reich's Commissariat, and then those swil filthy Slavs invaded Muscovy. Just how many years have been since he last saw Königsberg? Too long. The third phase of General Planos has been co coming along just fine. His men can handle things on their own for a little while, surely. Some are worried about trouble back in Germany and here in Kiev, but it shouldn't be anything to worry about, and we can resolve the concerns once he returns. Back to Prussia. Eric Cox seemed happy for the first time in a very long while. At first, the secretaries were confused. After all, the situation with the partisans had not improved, and on top of that, of Oldendorf, Labrat, and Brautagam were still vying for power as always. However, Cox's secretaries would soon realize the cause of his joy when he sent them a message. He'd be leaving for East Prussia in the next few days and spend a few weeks up there. As he fiercely packed his belongings, the smile remained plastered on his face. Cox had spent the last 20 years stuck in this miserable position with Reich's Commissar of Ukraine and having to deal with the natives and his fellow Germans alike. <clears throat> All of them seemed ready to pounce upon him and eat him alive like vultures at the slightest showing any sort of weakness. Now, although he could go back to his adopted home, memories of his time as both Gauleiter and Oba president of East Prussia filled his mind as he continued back. Back in those days before Barbarossa, before being appointed to this backwater of a Reich, had the, he, he had been the one in charge of the region and second only to the fear himself. It purged his domain of poverty and unemployment, and East Prussia became a beacon of prosperity for the entire Reich. As he finished packing his things, he looked towards his desk and thought of something. Perhaps this vacation of his could be an opportunity. Perhaps the Reich's Commissar could pull some strings and not only be able to resign from his position, but to get his old titles back in East Prussia. Eric's smile grew ever wider as he prayed to God that he plotted what he plotted would come to pass. After all, if God was on his side, what could possibly go wrong? The city. Despite himself, uh, Bodan was always frightened of the city. Yes, yeah, some part of him knew that these places had been, been built decades ago. Uh, even centuries, they were Ukrainian, same as the fields and forests he fought for every day. Yet for all his life, there had been German outposts, out of state control and settlement with German names and a German way of life uh, intellectually. He knew that was mere fiction in the moment. Standing between swastikas and police officers, it felt horribly real. Both of store members sometimes had to enter the city, however. Today, on the orders of his commander, he was in the heart of the Rex Commissary at Kiev, looking to buy supplies for his fellow soldiers. Well, I hope that the captain's assignment didn't mean anything, given the risk of the mission. It further that the man may have given up on him and trust, he repeated unto himself. Trust. Finally found the right house. He gave a knock on the back entrance, and a man appeared, thin and rise, in awed expression. Bodan ducked inside for all spheres of the city. The room was small and unimpressive, and so was the deal. Some bandages and medicine for the king's ransom of foodstuffs, a bad deal, but a deal he was authorized to take. As Bodan left, the settler asked why he was bothered with these missions. He didn't even know how to respond. Bodan mumbled about something about liberty and slept into the night. He that suffers. Other men. A wasted time sitting around in their homes, dreaming of plans or the opportunity of men long dead. <clears throat> but Roman Taras Bospojevich uh, Shukhevsky, or Shukhevch, had better things to do. He had to attend his, to his men first and foremost, to see that they were in fighting condition or at least recovering well. Alas, he was not to be on the case on this visit to the other to the medical shelter. Wounded soldiers groaned around uh, uh, Shukhevsky, and only looked or likely to recover. A doctor himself, repressing tears of rage, had just told him that a majority of them, if not all, but the strongest, were certain to succumb to the infection unless resources that definitely could not arrive in the time were present. 
how disgusted him. What was the point of anything if the soldiers that were to fulfill the goals of the UPA were falling down like so many flies? How enraged him. So long as incompetence and an ideological hair splitting remain a priority, what choice would the soldiers of the insurgent army have but to fall dead? Those thoughts oscillated back and forth in Shuyev's minds. Shuyev's mind. Ahead. By the repetition, the reports began to resolve that something had to change, and that, that was the only person, he was the only person that could ensure that change. So now we come over here. Ten. We still need more. I want one more. We still have time, though. Um, we don't have full control here, which is not good enough for me. Um, so we might just do this one. We'll see. This is close. This is very close, actually. But I did want to do development and do experimental extraction methods, so. Because it'll increase the opportunity by 20, which is fantastic. Four. Seven. Eight, and we can meet it. Which is fantastic. A plot come to pass. An annoyed cock scornfully repeated his desire for a luxury flight out of the nearest airport to his secretary. Feeling as though he was taking, talking to a brick wall again. Again. He repeated the date and time of his departure before impatiently closing his office door. The secretary thought for a moment. Three days was not a lot of time to schedule a flight, but the work it would be worth it if it had been a few, few days free of Cox's abuse. On any other day, the secretary would have told her husband that Cox was going to fly far, far away for the first time since she had started working for him some years ago. Yet she was excited for the lengthy reprieve, and her husband had taken her out after getting a raise on, the, on any other day. The secretary's husband wouldn't have told the bartender that Cox would soon be leaving for Prussia. He had drank more than an attendant, and he let his tongue grow loose. On any other day, the bartender would have been so generous, but soon he had bought the happy couple around and shared the news with the other patrons. However, just like a beer from a broken mug, information seeps outside from where it was supposed to stay on the, any other day. With any other secretary. Or with any other Rex Commissar, it might have been a different story, but on this day, oh well, a patron walked out from the bar, finished his drink, and mumbled about something how even Cock was abandoning in his hellhole. And on this day, a dispirited Bodan Antonenko, returning from an unpleasant trade, happened to pass by the man and hear his slurred speech. Bodan turned to the man and asked him what he meant. Three days the man, the man responded, he's flying back to Prussia, the dude. And on that day, Bodan Antonenko realized he had a chance to change history. The skies of brethren smile upon us once more to catch a flight. Eric Cock never thought the time could fly as slowly as. Uh, the last 72 hours had. He felt as though each minute stretched longer than the last. Uh, scheming. Oh god, that goes out. And the shadows keep cocking key for as long as possible. His office work as of late had been dreadfully dull, more so than usual, as nothing interesting or new had happened in the days prior. A chauffeur knocked on his office door, already carrying his baggage. Despite his elation that day of departure finally arrived, Cock curtly informed the chauffeur that he would be driving his own car and that he only needed his own bags moved. The chauffeur left and Cock excitedly leapt as quickly as his age would allow after the young man, eager to become airborne. Aside from the increasingly warm disposition of his office staff, no, nearly nothing had happened in the office since he announced he was leaving. It was slow, dri slowly driving Cock mad, but he kept his composure knowing that soon, very soon, he'd be left and away from his miserable place. The happy thoughts were on Cock's mind as well. The cliques had lorded over. Abstained from the typical bickering, the resistance activity reports had slowed to an insignificant crawl and partisan activity was gleefully minimal. Had it been any other day, Cock would have noticed these quiet discrepancies and would have been disturbed. However, in a mere 45 minutes, it would no longer be Cock's problem, not until he eventually returned from Ostpreußen. On any other day, Cock would have noticed a small crowd that had gathered to see him off, but it was beyond caring. As soon as the trunk was shut, Cock had shut his door again and began to reach for his keys. On the any other day, he might have waited for a brief moment to relish his delight. On such a day, he might have heard the hushed tickets of a timer, mechanically counting away at the seconds and minutes and hours since it's been set. Alas, today was not such a day. Instead of hearing his car turn over, Cock heard the sharp click of the ignition, followed the deafening sound of a bomb igniting. So long. The Security Council. He did not have time to grieve for the next dying leader, nor Ukraine time to cheer him. New oppressors arrived in a mad dash, breaking apart the crown of the king and bu building new empires from his bones. The Rex Commissar, dying but early, was suddenly thrust into madness. It started with the deputy. That Brown was in wasting no time in uh, taking Rex Commissar Cox's place as best he could, spewing the empty puffery that constituted his typical leadership. Setting president, setting order, he donned the uniform which had never been meant for him. He had decades of irrelevance, could not be overturned in a day. That Brown was a useless vestigial figure and had been for half a decade. For about a gum. Labron's reforms were hollow, ready to be pushed aside by a new generation for Ollendorf. They were actively damaging to the threads of German society, to both, to many others in their factions, life under Lebron seemed simply intolerable. So forced together by circumstance, the diplomat and the policeman forced Lebron's hand. Together, they came to the deputy, with a plan to share power as leaders in a temporary security council. Lebron would head the government, but now as the head of a larger body of leading German officials, of which a considerable number would be on the side of the newfound enemies. Lebron did not even time to have, have time to panic. He simply smiled, winced, and signed off on papers. This is how Ukraine came to be conquered by all, yet governed by no one. One more failure. The illusion shatters, and the Rex Commissariat's hold on Ukraine has never been weaker. The Rex's vision of paradise has been set aflame. Security Council be added to our sort of laws. The Battle for Cox's Thrones begins. Happy July! But Eric. Jorg Lebrandt. 
Ukrainian director. And his years a deputy, Yog Lebron always dreamed of a moment like this, to see Cock killed by his own hubris, to see every fall of his old regime lay bare. The concept of such a dramatic collapse had come as a spiteful fantasy to the deputy, yet his dreams always ended with a domain as stable and functional, a product of his scientific reforms. They never ended like this. Shoved into the twisted throne of Air Cock, Lebron never realized that the degree of mismanagement at every level of the Rex Commissariat, yes. This deputy had seen the Ukrainians as natural allies, but the scale of their insubordination outmatched even his most dire scenarios. When he imagined himself the sole reformer of Cox's broken system, he must now share power with those two fellow visionaries who shoot down every one of his proposals. Even now, here is talk in the halls of this hopped-up deputy who will be swept away soon as the war is over. Insubordination seems as outlasted even the Rex Commissariat itself. There's no time for reform. There's no place for change. As LeBron looks around his dying colony, he can only think of one, 23 years, or one thought, 23 years. More than two decades of badly formulated plans, ill-conceived rhetoric, and petty infighting have left Ukrainian in, in this moment. Woe to the man who's left to pick up the pieces. Yeah. The melt of rot. Rex Commissar Cock lies comatose in Kiev, and the state is assailed. From all sides and from resources, too numerous to count. The natives shriek in rebellion as the repairs and strike out at our soldiers and installations. Factions within the party bicker and sabotage each other, and both news and resupply from the Reich is increasingly scant. It's clear that the progress of the rot that so many have said and fast Ukraine is reaching its terminal phase, the decisive action in all spheres must be taken, we and the state as a whole must be ready to do anything to sacrifice anything in order to survive. Politics cannot be silenced. The generals run amok. Um... The weakness of the state can no longer be hidden, and our many foes are wasting no time in taking advantage. The culturalist movement, the UPA, and more violent fringe groups, and more are growing rapidly, and instability is growing just as quickly. So by desperate needs elsewhere, this problem can no longer be ignored, and so the SEPO will be empowered and funded to the degree necessary to combat them. Those who don't solve the problems overnight, and at least initially, they'll not be engaging the movements directly, but they can fight them indirectly and we can avoid falling any further from behind in the secret war. Oh, these guys are definitely empowered now. Oh god, 60%. That's not good. The calling. A meeting for the SIPO or Security Council concluded another day of butting heads. The word Ein Volk never falls off falls. The three leaders only found the visions in each other's dreams. Um, <clears throat> each quarreling was a petty obstruction to another man's ambitions. Uh, Jorg Lebrandt read reports of alone in his lamp at office on the Ukrainian National Council of Pet Peoples. They suffered the same as he did, watching a land they cherished uh, descended into decay. On the face of it, he meant to be the most powerful person in Ukraine, but the insubordination haunted him at every step. Oldendorf and Bratzegam had to be put in their place. Otto Oldendorf finished compiling another list of recommendations. Another set of initiatives that Brat would dismiss or subvert. He was a weakling grasping a concept that would, he would hammer together as part of his grotesque fantasy for Germany's lands. What he had done, d done to deserve being under that oafish Rosenberg got mind of his, it was a situation that had to change. All until the to come work through the night. They couldn't afford to take a break while his colleagues were already entrenching their positions. Lebrun promised that reform would deliver in its barest form, and Oldendorf promised his own brand of reform, but worryingly, he could deliver to the Ukraine in full. These natives deserve better young men with new ideas. They deserve Bratagam. From heights far above their earthly realm, destiny watched over all of them, having contemplated their visions long enough. Their plans seemed so tiny and insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but perhaps one of them was worth favoring, just one. Lebrun's reveries will turn into reality. Oldendorf's orders will not go to waste. Bratagam's plans will see the light. Well, let's go with Lebrun's for this campaign. Okay, what do we got here? Oh, shnikes. Hitler ran the NSDAP under the all-powerful Alfeo principle, the principle that great societies are governed by lone autocrats, on shock off from the burdens of red tape, in other words, power exists to be wielded and can only be held by one. Those in the Security Council are already aware of this reality already. Three leading figures, Brautigam, Lebrons, and Ollendorf, are preparing to wield the Führer principle and take over completely, yet without any orders from the Eastern Ministry, the choice of the leader will come from within the Security Council and its backers. To take power. A uh, candidate for the Reichskommissar is going to need to the blessing of at least two of the four leading Reichskommissar institutions whenever the time comes, likely once the immediate security problems are resolved. This will require maintaining some more support within these key institutions than opposing candidates. If they have the most support, that institution will be displayed as a line to them for the moment, although this is always changing. So we want Lebrant. A motley group exiles from across the Reich, the bureaucracy of the Reichskommissar can only seem to agree on a single phrase stability must be restored. They propose no resolution, no direction, and should one wish to rule the Rex threat, he will need to provide one. The Industrialists. The great mass of landlords, shareholders, and industrial barons in Ukraine are collectively known as the Industrialists. The beneficiaries of the Reich system of slavery and slaughter, they are perhaps the only men who truly benefit from the crumbling Ukrainian state and which keep it alive, however. Okay, so we want Le Brandt for now. You uplifted. Uh, from the horrific mistreatment of the hunger plan, it's a small set of Ukrainians stand alongside their German masters, initially of minor importance, recent reforms have ballooned their influence within the Rex Commissariat, like it or not. Uh, the collaborators are now saying the future of Ukraine. 
police. The police may not be the most glamorous wing of the Reichskommiss to but it's the most effective and brutal in its methods. Uh, as Ukraine ends, uh, all in reference to support, uh, Ukraine erodes. The police set their violence as a final stand against barbarism. The Ukrainian people, and even portions of the government, see them for what they are butchers. So, what do you got here? Tighten the grip. A sewage orthodoxy. Hey, get more stability. Actually, actually, it's really good to get. But decreases the collaborationists. What is this? Interesting. Reinforce ac academics. Gain resources diverted. Weekly war support. Oh. For a certain number of days. If not selected within nine days. Factionalism intensifies. Oh crap. When selected. Huh. Resistance status changes. So if not selected, so we need to select this. Right? All endorphin and next reprisals. If not selected, support goes up for them. So where are we at with this then? 60%, 39%, that's really bad. Um, Shinakis. So we've got here, I don't think we need to increase this anymore. Our exploitation of Ukraine is pretty good right now, and we gotta focus more on the resistance side of things anyways. Jesus Christ, this is bad. Um, so the melting rot, degenerate strong amok. Um, now we have to focus on this. The brunt, they barely have more support. Uh, I'm gonna say, uh, you know what? We don't need to save yet. If this doesn't go well for us, then so be it. I want these three center regions to be fully under us at the very least. Crack down a banner tree. It was go up by five percent. It did nice. I want this to be under us for hundred percent. But we'll see in just a little bit. Uh, there's too much commies right here. You can doors. Yeah, that's pretty bad. I think that's what we're going to have to do. Partisan activity skyrockets. It's now obvious to all that the stack attack on Rex Commissar Kalko was not as an isolated incident, but rather the commencing action in a wider campaign into civilization. Oh, crap. Reports have reached us of an explosion in banditry uh, uh, throughout the state, occurring not only in contested areas, but in regions previously considered to be pacified, suggesting a disturbing level of both planning and subversion. Garrisons are being overwhelmed, and there are insufficient forces available to effect immediate reinforcement. Worst yet, calls for assistance to Germany or otherwise are not being returned, and supplies are beginning to run low. There can be no doubt that the state is now engaged in a struggle for existence, and it's far more likely that the situation is going to get worse before it gets better. We must prepare ourselves as best we are for what is to come. Dark days in indeed are ahead. I don't mind that extra stability. The police goes down by 5%. We would increase our support there too. Um, decrease the support among the collaborators. I'm going to choose that one because that does give us more stability and we we need stability right now we gotta make sure this special doesn't get any higher Can't choose this one, that's fine. The communist resurgence. Reports have arrived from the few garrisons that have managed to defeat initial and vigorous bandit attacks. They have identified their assailants as communists, previously thought all but exterminated. This in itself would be grave news, but far worse than the identity of the attackers is the location of the attacks, um, which have occurred not only inside but also beyond the Donbass. They have spread their poison without discovery and are exploiting the lack of preparation of secured areas to cause immediate destruction. Oh, crap. More attacks are reported every day, and the complexity and effect are only increasing. Worse, the intensity of these operations appears unaffected by the severity, or lack thereof, of the anti bennett operation decreed for any one area, a phenomenon not seen since the West Russian War. 
This is a terrible opponent for both stability and serenity, and we must expect attacks to continue and increase in intensity until a resolution, a resolution can be found. Are the comments are still here? Wait. Growth will increase and get more liquid reserves. This is really bad. Meeting of the Severity, Security Council. The news of the uh, clock's collapse had seized the entire Rex Commissar in a paralyzing grasp. The state's executive was very, by very design, almost wholly dependent on his power and direction. Without it, no, without it, nobody knew what to do. But the bandits and rebels moved nonetheless, so when I took the charge, that's almost Jorg Lebrant. Understanding the seriousness of the situation, quickly worked to gather every senior official he could, and in this he surprised many. His well-known infuriating fashion for a rational argument was dropped in favor of what could be called a plea, a plea that the state could not stand still. Now when his enemies were moving decisively, none could argue that, at least and before long, the Security Council, as it been so dubbed, was having its second meeting. A tense atmosphere, hung over the event, each five from carefully created and justly guarded, felt that Lebrant was attempting to weaken them, centralizing power in himself, but they all understood that if they fell, they all fell together, metaphorically, as well as the end of the bandits rope, so soon agreements started to be heard. First from Brautagam, who spoke with increasing confidence about the council as a method to advance reform. Then the other functionaries and officials, even finally from Oldendorf, who broke silence several times to agree with the route of cautious reform and the maintenance of order. So the will of government began to turn once again, this is averted for now. Security Council is not the only person in Rex Commissariat. We cannot do everything on our own. Divided Security Council. More stability would be nice. The crumbling throne. The Nashus Westward. Bolsheviks eastward. Despite the state's best efforts over many years, a degenerate cancer that is Bolshevism still endures in the partisans and other insurgents that infest the eastern provinces. They have pillaged and raided, burned, and interfered with transits to the Reich for too, far too long and must be crushed like the vermin they are. Sending large contingents of security forces eastward should, when combined with a suitable campaign of propaganda, allow us to finally eradicate them. Peace will be returned when these remnants are destroyed, if only because there is no one left to break it. The Ukrainian Hydra. Crap. For decades, the primary threat to the state from Ukrainian Republicans was the UPA. The dedication, extremism, and absolute hatred for administration ensured that, despite their status as bandits, they were a dangerous and enduring foe. Recent Republican attacks, however, had to increase, uh, increasingly originated from other smaller organizations. The organization of both Borovitz and Horos has exploded in both size and capability, missed by the security services, and should be considered just as or as even more dangerous than the UPA itself. What's worse, they've proven surprisingly well equipped, having acquired or otherwise stolen German equipment from an unknown source. While we must be ready to engage them at a moment's notice, the one reprieve we have is granted is that an apparently disunity between them and the UPA at large, which reports of an interesting skirmishes between them at multiple locations. This divides their efforts, blunts their effectiveness, and saps their respective strengths. We must take advantage of We're able. There is no end to them. A young hero. Where do you think you're going, whore? Uh, Key bit back a curse as he instinctively ducked into the mouth of a nearby alleyway. Down on the street, the usual group of Hitler youth thugs were once again harassing some poor girl. He attempted to uh, time his trip to the bakery well enough to avoid them, but now they were standing between him and his home. In his home. Bust their bull in this woman. He tucked his bread into his coat and picked up a heavy stone that fit nicely in his hand. Picking out of the alleyway for a moment and aiming for the biggest kid he could see, Key chucked the rock at him and ran for it. He sprinted down the alleyway, dodging trash and hopping puddles before the ducking down a side street, finding himself in a dead end face to face with a towering wooden fence. If it was any way I was going to get away, this was it. He clambered over her, doing his best to protect his bread by landing squarely on his back. Key heard the clattering of boots passing by, but it was too transfixed by the sight of in front of him to think about it. He found himself in a courtyard littered with posters, noticed and graffiti. Workers of Ukraine unite, live and die for the Republic. A Ukraine ruled by the Ukrainians. One poster fluttered off the wall and towards the ground, but Key rushed forwards and snatched it out of the air, printing it across from the front of the sheet with simple black text, Imagine a Free Ukraine. Kai tried to do just that. What would a free Ukraine mean? Would mean Ukraine where he's free to eat a meal every day rather than spitting his, splitting his loaf with bread with his sister? Would mean Ukraine where his sister was free to go to the store by herself without being harassed by the Aryan thugs every day? Would mean a Ukraine where he could leave Kiev when uh, it pleased, and Kiev, uh, instead of being struck here for the last 15 years of his life? Kai wanted to find out. So he started hatching a plan. We're freaking screwed. A nightmare reborn, following the so-called second struggle, believed that the UPA had been essentially destroyed through the actions of both the state. Oh god, this is getting higher. Uh, that's really bad. Uh, actions of both the state security services and local garrison anti-bandit operations. Clearly this belief was in error. Grave error. Uh, under uh, Kievsky's leadership, the UPA has been reinvigorated, has recovered much of its initial strength, and obtained significant quantities of arms and has planned a coordinated offensive against both the administration and its ideological enemies. Going by the reports of our field commanders, it has been very successful in this. In this. Attacks have been observed against all groups the UPA brands as enemies, Democrats, Communists, Germans, and even the remaining Polish population. 
The attacks themselves have been very vicious and terroristic in nature, and the only positive thought that we can extract from this is that such universal offensive wins them no friends and many enemies, but in their effectiveness towards us and dividing the focus. We must exploit this, for they are possibly the single greatest threat to the security of our regime, and were they to emerge victorious, there would be scant mercy towards any of us. They were only waiting. God, I hate communists. No updates. Out of the dining room and into the kitchen, the last notes of the NSDAP anthem blare through shrill speakers. And suddenly, the eardrums, Vito Pita von Norden sat in an old wooden chair, his head bent towards the radio. His whole face was caked with sweat. He could not help but look down in a mix of shame and fear. Out of the radio came the news. Bandits, likely allowed with Judeo-Bolshevik forces, had attempted an assassination of the Reichs Commissar Koch. He has not perished, the newscaster said. He was far too strong to die. Yet the NSDAP... Officials refused to clarify Cox's current state. It was a clear sign of an awful fate and a source of endless, undying concern. As the day passed, Antonia watched as the news crumpled her husband. It had left the man unfit for labor on a crucial harvesting day and an impervious to any consolation. Cox was a good man, she tried to assure him, but the Reich had many more to send. Peter only responded with a harsh command to leave him and his begin dinner. Perhaps it was kind of a trauma, Antonia thought to herself. Despite herself, part of her worried it might be more of a fundamental weakness. As she worked over the burning oven, Marcus had decided a thought remained in her mind. Peter cannot stay with Cox forever. Looking uh, for the past. Uh, Kai, or Kai, uh, dodged his way around the patrols and through alleyways until he arrived at a hidden market, where he was certain that something useful would show up. He said to look for something about the Ukraine that he was near the top, but Kai uh, soon found himself wandering in the circles, unsure where to look for such a risky item, or even if such an item existed anymore. As Kai uh, sc uh, grew more sure of the futility of the search, an old man pointed at him and beckoned him over with a snarled, twisted appendage that many years ago must have been a finger. At the wit's end, Kai shuffled over to the old man cripple, who he knew was Taras. Looking for something, Kai? He crawled, keeping a steady eye on the prospective customer. Kai spoke slightly louder than a whisper. I'm looking for anything about... Uh, he looked around, apprehensive to sharing his quest with a stranger. And now Jones continued about the history of Ukraine. I want to know what happened here before the Germans. What was Ukraine before all this? He gestured around vaguely, perhaps towards Kiev, perhaps towards Ukraine. Greeting a half-toothless smile. Uh, Taras. I hobbled over to a nearby trash heap, dug around for a moment, then hobbled back to Kai, carrying a dusty brown package. Kai held out the stolen package of his father's cigarettes, which Taras took as he placed the package in Kai's hand. Slava Ukraine. Uh, Taras whispered, now get home before you get both of us shot. Taras chuckled dryly as he leaned back to watch a young lad sprint off towards home. He has to say, this was all highly illegal. As soon as Kai returned home, he hid in his room and tore the packing to get what he was inside, a book, on the cover. I saw gray littering on a dingy yellow background, the words, the complete history of Ukraine and her people, shining through the grime. Kai spent the night, uh, and a better part of the next morning, reading intently throughout the old tomb. Do not forget, with good intent, to speak quietly of me. Politics cannot be silenced. 21 day focuses are insane here. Absolutely insane for what we have to deal with. The petty squabbles of party factions and the Rex Commissar right must stop. Everybody in Joe, we, the party, must be united in purpose, and these artificial divisions must, will be erased. Olandorf and Brautagon will surely understand the need to put aside their opposition for the good of the Reich. Surely not encouragement will be given through a political concession, ensuring proper concern and review is given to the most critical parts of the future of Genesis. Out of the crisis, of course, is resolved. Chaos near Mykolaiv. Despite the state's best efforts, banditry continues to increase across Ukraine, where there is only a course of a massive increase in general level of chaotic action. The current focus of the security forces of the Michael Vaiv region. Oh, shnikes. There, the force of the UASSR, a mockery there ever was one, has risen, and far more organized than any in the administration previously thought. Local security commanders have taken course taken action, and our positive against bandits have increased tenfold. It has been responded to by a number of assaults upon our garrisons, ambushes upon our patrols, and other crimes in the bandits' parts. Given the surprising intensity of the conflict, it is not yet clear whether the bandits or our security forces will emerge victorious. We can only hope for the former. Should an alternative occur, it would be supposed to disaster for any stabilization efforts in the future. Um, for the sake of the Rex Commissar, yeah, we hope that that doesn't happen. Security matters. A series of knocks made both of them turn their heads. Daniel frowned as he stood, when Halinya warily turned attention to the door. A few explanations entered Daniel's mind, none of them good. They weren't expecting any gas, and the only possible visitors were the ones who spoke trouble. It's why he wasn't surprised to find a police officer on the other side of the door. It was an older man, with a square face, grizzled features, and a part of a large physique. Good afternoon, Officer Daniel said, keeping his voice polite. How can I help? Always be proactive, always be cooperative, give nothing but compliance. It was the only reasonable approach when it came to law enforcement. We also nodded slowly. We're tracking parts and activity in this area and acquire any information you have about their whereabouts. We've had reports they've been seen around this residence. Daniel, though, didn't know if it was a trick or not, but I didn't change the answer. I try to avoid trouble, sir. Uh, there are unknown people around my house, I know as little as you. You're certain you have no knowledge at all, the officer press. Many partisans are not just in the streets, they hid among civilians, obscure their politics. Yes, officer, I'm certain, he interrupted. Both my wife and I eschew politics and have no desire to involve ourselves in them. We'll let you know if we see this, anything, anyone or anything suspicious, but I'm sorry, I can't tell you what, I, uh, what you want to know. The officer pursed his lips, obviously dissatisfied with the answer, but he seemed to realize that he wasn't lying. However, it didn't stop him from giving one final warning as he turned to leave. 
We take security very seriously, Mr. Nosenko. The moment you see something to us, or there will be consequences. You know, can't keep doing that one, because... Yeah, control is slightly increased, but still, it's not very much. Questions of the unknown. Thoughts of the past filled Kai's mind. What was there to know that he'd been kept from? What people had been there before him? What great men and women shaped the land he called home? Such questions in a schoolroom would end with his family being enslaved or worse, and any attempts to pry information from his father had ended in certain dismissive platitudes about a son's duty to his family and the price they would all pay for young Kai's, Kai's curiosity. His questions would remain unanswered or over a supper of bread and cabbage stew, sulking silently in his bedroom. Kai was thinking of ways of learning the truth when he heard the shots from outside. Quickly, he sewed the book underneath his bedding and peeked out his head over the window sill to view the commotion outside to his horror. An opal blitz had parked in front of the neighboring building. However, to his great relief, the unloaded soldiers headed towards an adjacent warehouse far away from Kai and his trees and his thoughts. After a moment, and as suddenly, as Kai could duck and cover behind the wall, a series of shouts, cacophony, and gunshots, and the hollow din of a small explosion filled his buzzing mind with ringing. No more than half a minute passed before everything was still and quiet again. Kai, for much consideration, picked his head back above the cover, only to gaze upon the remains of a dozen German soldiers laying bloodied and ravaged in the dirt streets, lit only by the dim glow of a distant street lamp. The little blitz was gone, and not by a single soul was to be seen. Kai wondered with a still rapidly beating heart what he had just witnessed, and who would dare to be so brave to assault a garrison. The thought of the Ukrainians fighting for their homeland against an oppressive regime filled Kai with a new feeling, one he could not remember but feeling for a long, long time. Hope. Sundering your chains, bless your freedoms with the blood of the foeman's evil veins. Pinned. You all impress himself against the wall, feeling the cold concrete against his trembling back. The old prison had been built to last, but that didn't mean it would. He heard another crack of the rifle fire, and his heartbeat quickened. As he got closer, they got more frequent, like a coming thunderstorm. He checked the ammunition of his own weapon, not a single bullet fired, despite ages of drills. For this exact scenario, Johan could barely remember where he was. He had fled the second, the tenth partisan, emerged from the woods, and the fourth bullet tore into Anton's chest until his moment where he hid in some alley hallway, now stood in the court heart of the prison. He listened to the radio crackle. The other soldiers likely wanted to know where he was, but every second there were fewer. Uh, they all stopped around the same time as the gunfire. The silence of the grave smothered them. He carried on, slowly retracting his steps. As he began to ponder, surrender, he heard a voice behind him. Getting what's coming to you, then, huh? A man spat from behind the ball orders of his cell. Yohan stumbled into the main ward, and the whispers and venom had already begun to echo out the desolate walls. He turned to his heel, looking upon the emaciated ex-partisans. The pleased grins contrasted their miserable conditions, lending them the appearance of vengeful ghosts. Quiet, you're still prisoners of the Rack's Commissariat. I'll have you all shot. He declared with less than certain conviction. All I got in return was laughter. Where's the rest of your little gang? Hissed the little man from before. Did they all get killed, or did you abandon them? Soon, voices were calling out down the hall. Yohan Ukrainian was tough and rough, but he knew that they were coming from. He braced himself as a guilt and moral terror sweeped into his heart. Perhaps this was what he deserved, but he knew it was far too late for penance as fate's punishment arrived in the form of a bullet. I just wanted that. He knew that political power badly. And stability. Um, as much as I want to do the Bolsheviks' east words, it's just we can't do it. I like this one, though. Spears from below and the Nationals' west words. This would be good. Daily uh, command power gain? That's all right. Consider the industrialists. That'd be nice. Um, yeah. Fissures widen. We need stability. Spirits from below. While Ollendorf brought to Gaum and led Brandt easily among the most influential parties in the state, there are others, and collectively those others hold far more power than many think. The SS, with incessant demands for land purity and iron control. The collaborators with their pushes for ever greater Ukrainian rights and autonomy, all of whom have goals that demand the allocation of resources. All these resources are becoming increasingly scarce as time passes, and the worse this gets, the more elected that is that they'll consider taking alternative actions. We must be ready. We must be watchful. A patriot's resolution. Kai has been less than a week reading the great book from front to back. The plight of his people captivated him and remained always on his mind. After finishing the book for the second time, Kai went out for a walk. It was well past midnight, and the patrols were scarcely concerned under the cover of a moonless night. Even if they were, Kai only thought of the partisans he saw the other day, and of his role in the great story of uh, future Ukraine. They found himself. At the banks of the Nipo River, wondering what he could do, <clears throat> not knowing what he could do, let alone what he wanted to do. As he began the trek home, a familiar voice called out to him. Taras from under a nearby bridge had once again beckoned him near and tried to compel Kai to confide in him. Jesus' questions regarding the book, his thoughts, desires, and worth. Kai dodged all the questions, tactically giving curt and vague answers, revealing his inner confusion. Then, as he tried to leave again, Taras shouted out to him, "Remember your people, Kai. Remember your mother." Kai had never known his mother, and his curiosity once again got the better of him. Now it was his turn to ask questions after question. However, Taras was not so timid in his answers, and told Kai about his mother's torture, rape, and murder. They went on about the screaming, the whimpering, the wretched sobs, and the gunshot. He did not enjoy telling the truth, nor did Kai enjoy hearing the truth. By the end, Kai had made up his mind. He didn't know yet who he would throw his lot in with, but he knew that he must fight against the Germans in one way or as he could. As Kai started home for good, Taras yelled one last bit of encouragement. Never forget your roots. Never forget your people's history. Kai felt dedicated to those memories, his country, his people, his mother. He made up his mind. He had to leave. 
He had to be free. As politics cannot be silenced. Description below. Because this is still getting worse. And the Battle of Zitomir. Perhaps nowhere else in the country is more reflective of anarchy than Zitomir. There, nearly every flavor of banner clashes with both the state security service forces as well as each other. Arke, Yunra, Upa, and UASSR are all present in great numbers and casualties among all sides increased by the day. So too does the density of the violence. Ben is, of course, no no limits on the brutality, and security forces are required not to only respond in kind, but also escalate in uh, response. Cycles continue for some time, and despite the shocking atrocities inflicted upon the population by the so-called freedom fighters, there appears to be no end in sight. Many claim that the Reich's commissariat is on the verge of collapse, but as, as the fighting here in the most volatile region shows, state security forces remain committed to protecting the integrity of the administration. Reinforcements have been dispatched in support of the garrisons has increased, but as of yet none can say whether such aid will prove decisive. Uh, as, it, as it is do we do so, we must wait for the final reports and hope the uh, order emerges victorious. As much as I want to do all the stuff, we don't have time for it. Oh, Distillation falls by two. That's pretty good, but I want to get this one. Factionalism intensifies. I don't want to lose that stability and whatnot, too. And increases our control. The fissure widens. There was a growing tension throughout the highest levels of the Reichs Commissariat, Ukraine. Uh, one that everyone perceives, but none were openly willing to acknowledge yet. Yet the bombing of Koch and his loss of leadership had ended an undisputed chain of command, and presented opportunities that no one was willing to overlook, even as it risked further instability. The ongoing war with the Ukrainian partisans continued to intensify, but it was no longer the only war that mattered. Within the Reichs Commissariat administration, there was another, quieter war for influence beginning. The seeds had been planted long ago, and the bombing had brought them to bloom. Everyone appeared to realize the town was now or never again. Many ranking officials and officers had aligned to a rally with themselves around three most important men in the Reichs Commissariat. Georg Leibrandt, Otto Oldendorf, and Hans Otto Brautigam. Conventional wisdom at least looking from the outside in believed that Leibrandt was a clear advantage in this battle for influence as acting Rex Commissar. The reality, though, was not so certain. Each man had their own collection of allies, friends, and opportunists who could have sought to align themselves with the man who they bet would emerge from the, from the struggle victoriously. Many others in the Rex Commissar remained on the sidelines for now, unwilling to throw the support behind anyone until there was a clear frontliner. The only thing for all of them was certain. The years of tension, rivalry, and ambition were coming to a head, and with cock indisposed, it could not be stopped. Each man believed themselves the heir to the rocks of basket, and only the one who could lead it through the storm that had befallen them. The town would soon reveal a victor. Unleash the Kamp Gruppen. I would like this one more, though. Uh, I guess the nationalists westward. Though there are countless sources of instability in the east, we cannot afford to ignore or overlook the nationalist movements in the west either. The Ukrainian insurgent army and the Ukrainian National Revolutionary Army are just as much of a threat to the national security as is any of the countless movements, and so we're signing some state security forces focused towards democratic oversights for far too long in existence. Digging out double agents, false collaborators, radical resistance cells, and the like should help us endure these dark times. Once these times are passed, true suppression can begin. Good God. I want this one, but we can't afford it right now. East for flight. A vicious banner of attack upon Eric Commissar. Uh, well, vicious banner attack upon Eric Commissar Cock was, as we know now, uh, but a portion of things to come. The explosion of banner activity clearly pre-planned is forced to take drastic action. One of the most consequential in which is the Western regions. Here, perhaps more than anywhere else, corruption, bandit subversion, general malfeasance has led to countless reports of treason activity. Desertions, defections, and outright betrayals by auxiliary units abound, and drastic action must be taken in response. We will for a time withdraw the most unreliable portions of the state apparatus eastwards, auxiliaries. Ukrainian support staff and others of the questionable loyalty will be evacuated in more secure regions. Uh, those of unquestionable loyalty, namely Wehrmacht garrisons and SS troop detachments, will remain, and be empowered with an arm, e uh, even freer hand for operational discretion. We must have victory over the bandits. Once that is achieved, the auxiliaries can return, minus the infiltrators we will dig them out. Untrustworthy swine. Because we want to do this revive civil authority. The ext extensive security crackdowns are causing backlash in our large urban areas, with increasing reports of civil unrest and general agitation. This cannot be allowed to continue. We simply do not have the resources to pacify major cities should they revolt, and so we must crush the sediment before it grows. Increasing police resources should help us in maintaining order, and further assist the SIPO in discovering and eradicating the influence of the resistance movements within the major population centers as well. The crackdown. Finally, after much loss and withdrawal, the counterattack against the bandits begins. Led by the vanguard, uh, by Ollendorf and the SS units present within the state, they have moved decisively to take control and stabilize the situation. Oh, thank God. 
though much has already been lost, the recent days and weeks of desperate fighting made at least allow sufficient time for the state to mobilize new formations of auxiliary troops, test up for loyalty and confirm to be so, and regu perform regular Wehrmacht units to act in support. Operating at all endorsed instruction, they've retaken many areas, rearward and otherwise, and stabilized many areas previously invaded by the bandits. There are, however, many reports of extreme aggressive uh, action and reprisals taken against bandits supporting civilian population concentrations, with casualties running into the many thousands. Given the circumstances, these have been deemed necessary and reasonable. Such actions have been pacified at the areas. Uh, regardless of the severe anger displayed by the Ukrainians, they will have to live with it. It will do for now. Thank God. Jesus Christ, this is terrible for us. But what, what, what do you expect, you know? Development has greatly fallen back to where we basically started, which really sucks. Yeah, as much as I want to do this one, we just don't... We just... we got to focus on the resistance of stuff. Um, I'll only do this one first, but let's read about Burns of Authority. Officer Gabriel Kors disliked the predicament he found himself in. Authority is something that's sought by many, and when the chain of command was clear that the superiors were aligned, it was a useful thing to hold. Uh, it was far less appetizing when one was caught between competing interests and motivations. Resources were in short supply in Ukraine, especially right now. The parts of the problem was proving resilient, and one, while one might expect the various militant interests in the Rex Commissariat to be aligned, they were not. With the resources they had recently been able to acquire, demands had quickly come from both the assets and Ukrainian National Army, and thus a dilemma emerged. The UNA were ultimately collaborators, while of course knew that they were important to overall strategy for the region, it couldn't help but hold some wariness at arming Ukrainians further, especially with the partisan problem worsening. Loyalty concerns were the primary reason the SS was demanding the resources be allocated to them. Even if it wasn't strictly following protocols, there was no doubt that the SS were loyal to Germany and Germany alone at the same time. This wasn't a choice of personal preferences. The request to supply the UNA came directly from the Deputy Rex Commissar, and while the SS had made it clear that they were acting in Germany's interests. What well, defined the instructions of the Deputy Rex Commissar was almost unthinkable, potentially making an enemy of the SS was almost as bad. Unfortunately, he needed to make a choice and throw his lot in with one side or the other. But sure Germany's interests are fulfilled, the SS will have all they need. LeBron's instructions are clear. The UNA will have the resources. You know what, we wanted Le we're going with LeBron for now, so... We're probably killing ourselves. Low government control. Yeah. So, let's see what we can do here. Hey, that works. That's better. Um, increased by three and a half percent. It's not bad. Hundred percent full control in one area. That's actually really good. I'm gonna wait to do, do arm police down here for this one, and we want to lower their strength here, so we're gonna do this one. So that'll be good for now. So far, it's working out, but you know. It is what it is, a crumbling throne. As the state falls around, as one man in one position, power remains strong, if challenged. LeBron and his office have the potential to centralize crisis response, but he and it, it are beset by a number of bureaucratic shortcomings and other myriad of issues. He will be corrected through a directive, direct executive action, immediately, and his office will be empowered. It is true that taking such action will elevate LeBron himself and expand his control, overt or otherwise, over the apparatus, or apparatus of the government. But this must be accepted. There will be no government to fight over if the state collapses entirely, of course. Yeah, what do you expect? Oh. Development stats in every region advances by three. The aftermath. The state's counteroffensive has been successful. Most mostly in as much as the core of the state can be considered stabilized and we are no danger of imminent collapse, but we are far from victorious. Ah. Oh. Far from forgiven. Large swaths of the countryside and more than a few urban areas cannot be considered to be under state control, and the war against the bandits is in no way close to completion. Violence is sure to increase. Even past the heights to which it has already ascended, and despite the necessity of reprisal, such actions are sure to swell the bandits' ranks. Beyond such considerations also lies, of course, Germania. Ter Terse. Communications have indicated that the Heimat has given the state space and time, but it's not unlimited. The Grand Quota must be still fulfilled. It will be. Continued support demands it. The fight will continue, although our victory will likely be won over much of a reduced country. When a severe devastation and destruction, the bands will ensure it will be a victory. The state and its lands can be rebuilt. After all, we've done it before. Twice, in fact. Ooh. If not completed, we get 20 more political power. I have to let it complete, then. A children's story. Marcus was sent off to a meeting in a classroom many miles from the farmhouse. It was always exciting to go to class to meet his fellow Germans. Even the class was mostly long and didn't get to play as much as he wanted. This class was history, and Marcus felt very good at history. His dad loved to tell of history, a long and circular story of exciting wars and boring empires. Or empires. But today's lesson was special, for the teacher promised to tell the class about Ukraine. It seemed the class was very, very important. Yet the class made little sense to Marcus. His teacher told the class that the Ukraine was a province of the Reich, once full of Ukrainians, but now full of healthy Aryan Germans. Yet Marcus had seen many Ukrainians near his house, and there were no Germans nearby for him to play with. Why had he been forced to live with the Ukrainians? The Ukrainians were no fun. Papa seemed to think they were barely human at all. Could he move to where all the Germans were? Marcus wanted to ask his teacher about all the Ukrainians near his home, but he knew that what a teacher might do to a child who spoke out of turn, and thus he said nothing. Yet the lesson never really felt right. 
I would love to increase the GDP, but at times, uh, well, we can't quite do that. Fate of beauty. Both down proceeded at an urgent pace, driven by a bubbling mixture of anxiety and exhilaration. A small village wasn't a safer place to be, but it was better than where he'd just been a few days ago. A city crawling with police, looking for him, or at least men like him. It was an unfortunate necessity to pass through his own town. When he tried it the way he came, uh, he'd seen a fellow du gendarmerie on patrol, examining every grain of wheat. He barely slipped away with a wavering hand clipped close to the pistol on his hip. They were luckily already all over the region by now, and he had a sinking feeling they'd find the outpost in due time. Not before burning countless homes and fields, of course, this back road is seemingly overlooked and ha would have to do. It'd only be an hour at most, he reasoned to himself. The village was idyllic, in a dystopian way. It was surrounded by on all sides by miles upon miles of farmland, but rising smoke slowly the beauty. An ugly Vermont convoy in the distance did not ease its worries. A cobblestone street and single-story homes and businesses called back to a simpler time, but they still bore the scars of the occupation. The people were thin and clad in threadbare coats no better than wool sacks. There was a one-armed, shivering man begging with a lost war, playing in his eyes. Lastly, it was a newspaper stand, much was of its wares printed in German. Bodan knew better than to interact with anybody, but he was tempted to learn how the plan had gone. He dug a carbovenet out of his deep pockets, out of his coat, and handed it to the man who accepted it graciously in a strong German accent. Bodan claimed a state wrong and a rag of dribble, and scanned the front page. Grax Kumasar cock in critical condition after bombing. Suka, he muttered. He had every policeman and soldier in Ukraine on his heels because of this operation, and the man wasn't even dead. Tragic, is, tragic isn't it, said the German vendor. Bodan blinked and gave a dazed nod. Well then. Well, we can do this one finally. You got more command power, too, which we don't really need. A correct choice. Reading the most recent reports, LeBron found himself slowly nodding in approval. Ah! Officer Gabriel Quarch had been faced with a serious decision indeed, and he made the right choice. He resisted the intimidation of the SS, followed orders dispatched by LeBron, and dispersed the resources he had control over the, to the UNA, thus empowering the newly recruited UNA collaborators. They had served well and take casualties that would have otherwise been suffered by the German units. It was a significant victory. The collaborators were no longer paper targets would fight. The loss would then keep them weak and dependent and make their fighters loathe the insurgents of all flavors. Most importantly, however, this was a loss in both face and strength and part of the SS. They've been outmaneuvered and everyone knew it. Nice. On that thought, though, LeBron added a smile to his nod, imagining the look on Olendorf's face. He also arranged a major promotion for Korsh. The man deserved it for services he was not even aware of. Excellent, excellent, excellent. God, this is terrible. Hey, but we've lowered communist activity, which is fantastic. We're actually doing better now. It's 95%, 98%. Black Knights were full control, at least up here. This place is falling apart, but what else is new? The best nights were the ones where there was little to no natural light. These nights only occurred when the moon was dark or clouds covered it. Hal and Yad learned to watch for the session nights, and when they happened, to take advantage of them. They simply didn't know when the next one would come. She remembered her concern and fear she felt for the first time she snuck out. Not for herself, but what might happen if Daniel woke up and feared the worst. Fortunately, he was a heavy sleeper, and she was less nervous than when she slept away into the night low now. Not that she was gone for very long. The package she clutched tightly wasn't large. It was mostly canned goods she had hidden away over the course of a couple weeks and along with a few loaves of bread. It wasn't much, but she knew the local resistance needed every little bit of it. She knew she wasn't the only one who was giving them such packages either. All of them needed to do their part, herself included. She kept in the shadows, keeping a keen ear open in the case if she heard any cards or German patrols eventually. She turned into a small alley where one of the artisans was waiting. A young boy who knew to meet her when the moon was dark. She didn't know his name and she didn't ask if she didn't want to know anymore. All she did was hand him the package and he quickly took... Uh, which she quickly took, giving her a quick quiet but heartfelt thank you. Her quickly slipped away, she did the same, didn't let her guard down, she was back in bed with her husband. She, her sleep afterwards was always better, as she knew that more packages like hers were being delivered across the city. She was glad that the resistance would last just a little longer because of her help. Liberation would come one dish nation at a time. Traitor to the German Reich. Our most important tool. Without her collaborators, we would be dead in the water. Some may denounce the state of affairs, but as of now, it is how things are. Our long tangled webs of collaborators, mayors, and policemen are the greatest tools in our arsenal in our war against banditry and madness. We will augment these tools, creating new loyal police units, replacing disloyal mayors, and putting a close eye on all of our collaborators once they are properly strengthened and on a tight leash. Our task of bringing stability to this mess of our Mexico Mastrat will become much easier. We don't have time for this one now. Yeah, this is gonna suck. Ah, we're back. Good. And time to save just again, because I want to make sure that we actually get what we need done, and done well. Full control, I love it. Fantastic. Because right now we're 35 out of 40, which is better. Oh god, 67 days. We don't have the political power for it. You know.
so what happens if we, we get expected development level, but we and fulfill the demands, the Ukrainians will like us way less. So that's pretty normal at this point. Mm. So we got full control of three states, which is very good. I think that's fantastic. National Socialism versus National Socialism versus National Socialism. You got a lot of National Socialisms here. Poverty's pretty bad, though. Happy November, though. You think this is all what happened when, German, when Hitler dies, but nope. Ukraine's a mess. Deficit. Growth is not very much. Debt to GDP ratio is going up. Inflation is uh, doing okay. Reviving the civil authority. Which is good. Because with that... We have more debt, more admin efficiency begins to improve, more stability, which is finally good. But, you know, there's only so much we can really do here. If not selected, the selection falls. What is this? If not selected, we get more political power and whatnot. I do like that. Oh, it fell back down to 95%. That's not good. Um, increase the grain output by one. I just don't think we'd be able to increase. Uh, we only have so much political power. The Ukrainians are probably going to starve then. I mean, what else? What else can we do about it? Because we need this one. We need this. If not selected, growth will increase. We get more liquid reserves. Marcus's kingdom. His mother and father argued over the finances. Their eyes slipped from the dark dear Marcus and set him free. Uh, he slipped out of the crack in the front door and jumped into the wheat fields surrounding his home. His adventure began. The boy explored into lands uh, like a new continent. He felt everything with his senses. Uh, the air, the dirt, the insects, the grain. He claimed it all for himself and claimed more with every step. Marcus's uh, flight only lasts a few minutes. Antonia soon noticed her son's absence and saw the door idly bending into the breeze. She shouted his name from the porch and saw him as a shifting form in the rolling wheat near the forest where some said Parsons lay. She leaped up upon Marcus and pulled him back into the farmhouse. He recalled those fields that night, and for many nights after, he dreamt of his bed laid in the field of amber, and the flies and the beetles swirled around him for a crown for their master. He dreamt of bending the stalks in his hands and of his bare feet pressing to the dirt, a kingdom waiting for his return. Sepo's infiltration tactics. If we were to root out the degenerates, the insurgents, the partisans, and the outright criminals, we must do more than just attack them. We must infiltrate them, monitor their networks, determine what influence they possess, and only then root them out, root and sim entirely. We can order the Sepo to focus upon these tactics, uh, using their uniforms, cultivating double agents, encouraging defections, eliminating the influence networks, and more, and in doing so, ensure that they comprehensively annihilate them in the long term. Yeah. Upon the Phantom's game. Stepan Ordonitz stood, sat at his desk, motionless. His suit was done up tidily. Uh, his papers were shredded, their bits and fragments lying all around the desk like snow dusting. He was pale, beads of sweat forming on his brows. Eyes were fixed on the door. Every third of the pipes of pitter-patter of mice in the walls made him jump slightly. Footsteps in the hall. Ordonitz held back his ears, slowly getting up. The green uniformed men met Stepan with a cold salute. He invited them to sit down, but they refused, towering over him as he sank into his chair. Mr. Ordholnitz, we have received some rather disturbing reports of some of your conduct, one of the men. Taller and lankier than the others with the giant spectacles began. You are a sterling mayor by all accounts. You've been an advocate for public, uh, publicly hanging banderites and scourging them. You have even personally offered, ordered the deaths of at least five particularly dangerous individuals. You can imagine our shock or outrage when the report hit our desks. Ordholnitz's mouth was dry. I, I don't follow the speckled man's smirk. It's almost comically, comical bug eyes flaring. You have been incredibly accused of treason, Mr. Ord Orhonets, the man crowed in or crowed in his reedy voice. Orhonets steady. He's been obviously shaking since the aide rushed in with a tip off an hour ago, and he was, and now he was still. You have just stated why that very reason is impossible. Why would I jeopardize everything, everything to commit treason against the legitimate government of the Ukraine? Please enlighten to me. The bespectacled man drew back, as if surprised by his last ditch defense. I apologize, sir. We can never be too careful. Take him away. Stepan was lifted out of his chair and slammed to the ground. Ordonets, Stepan, arrested for treason with inconvertible proof of his collaboration with Judeo Bolshevik elements. Such a fall from grace, such a shame. Ordonets kicked and screamed pathetically. His subordinates' doors were all shut and locked. I swear, I swear, I swear you'll regret this. Keep out of your heads. You have no evidence. 
A few denizens of the city looked on as their mayor was thrown into a car like a defiant, spoiled toddler. They all shook their heads, a few of them laughed. Is that... is that the fifth? Sixth? The way to guilt. The dinner performed with stasis, and his appetite is non-existent. Daniel had wondered if he, even, if he would feel better in the hours after the encounter with the youth, but if anything, the felt of guilt and shame and regret had only entrenched itself further. He wasn't doing a good job of hiding it either, and it seemed like his wife was finally going to ask. You want to tell me, she finally said, putting her fork down, or do you want me to guess why you've been moping all day? He picked out his meal, and his voice halting as if confessing. He supposed that this was what it was. There was a young man, trying to hide from the police, a partisan, I think. At least that's what he looked like. He wanted to come in. He didn't look his wife in the eyes, she finished. I told him to move on. A heavy silence fell over the dinner. Daniel finally looked up at Hanya, whose expression was upset, but mostly disappointed, which made it only worse. You should have done that, she finally said quietly. Even if you can't hide him, you could have given him a meal. I know he said quietly, I should have done something. Hanya's face softened as she took his hand. There's nothing that can be done now. All we can do is pray that he is safe, we can do that much. Prayer was perhaps something that was too late now, perhaps it was not. Perhaps a miracle could happen, and perhaps a prayer would have sewaged the guilt. Both of them bowed their heads and offered a prayer for the young man wherever he was. Neither had expected to get, ever know if their prayer was answered. Expand Kampf Krupa Ollendorf. During the Great Crusade against Bolshevism, liberalism, and degeneracy, various SS forces coalesced in a Kampfgruppen. Such units proved useful in ad hoc capacity on all fronts, supplementing the efforts of other forces. They can be used again, though. Ollendorf shall assemble a new expanded Kampfgruppe. Kampfgruppe Ollendorf. This will assist the state greatly in prosecuting and protecting the upcoming trial, so it shall be done, regardless of what Lebrant and Vratagam might have to say about Ollendorf expanding his influence. But we must end the episode there. If you enjoyed the video though, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow to see what else we can do with Ukraine as we are buckling under the weight of everyone trying to kill each other. It's good times. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.